Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, hi, everybody. I recognize a few names on the list of participants, so welcome back to my speeches. Uh, my name is Nuritzi Sanchez, and I am the Senior Open Source Program Manager at GitLab. I have been in open source since about 2012. Um, my entry point was just that I helped uh, start a company that created a Linux-based distribution called Endless, created for people with little to no internet access. And I've also been on the board of directors at the GNOME Foundation. And a lot of what I do revolves around having good communication. So in this presentation, I'm hoping to share some of what I've learned with you all. Oops. Let's go back. <clears throat> Today, what we're going to cover are things like navigating cultural differences, improving feedback, active listening, and some of my favorite hacks. And if you've been to some of my talks before, and this is a conversation or this is a topic that I'm trying to give at multiple communities, because I think it's something that is crucial to uh, having diverse and um, uh, engaging communities, a place where everybody feels comfortable participating. So each time that I give this talk, I usually adapt it a little bit. In this presentation, I'll be talking a lot more about the feedback section, for example. But first, I'll go ahead and start off by talking about navigating cultural differences. And while there are many ways that we can think about how about cultural differences, um, I'm going to talk about one by Erin Meyer. She wrote a book called The Culture Map, and a lot of her research is on seven indicators about how cultures differ. These seven indicators are communicating, evaluating, leading, trusting, disagreeing, scheduling, and persuading. On the left, you see an image of what these different seven, seven indicators are, and I'll go through a few of them in order to let you know um, how the culture map works. Oh, sorry about this. Presentation isn't working. All right, so the first indicator is communicating. Low context cultures care about communication that is precise, simple, and clear. They oftentimes use repetition in order to avoid misunderstandings. In contrast, high context cultures think that good communication is sophisticated and nuanced and layered, and oftentimes you have to read between the lines. And so here you can see how different cultures uh, kind of align across these, this indicator, where low context cultures are on the left and high context cultures are on the right. These are just a few of the many countries and cultures that exist. But one of the things that I want you to notice is that even if two countries share a language, so for example, the United States and the UK, they still might be in different places in terms of this uh, spectrum of low context to high context, where the United States, for example, is very low context and the UK is more towards the middle. The next uh, indicator that we'll go over is evaluating. And this is about how cultures give negative feedback. Direct negative feedback, feedback cultures give feedback frankly, honestly, bluntly. They don't use soft, uh, they don't use positive messages to soften the negative ones. They use absolutes. So things like you always do this or you, you know, um, you're always late. And it's okay to uh, give this negative feedback in front of groups. On the other hand, indirect negative feedback cultures tend to give negative feedback softly, subtly, and diplomatically. They often use positive messages to wrap the negative ones. So if you've heard of the sandwich effect where you have a positive message and then a negative and then you follow it by a positive, that's what we mean by sandwich and you know softening it with positive messaging. Oftentimes these cultures use qualifying descriptors. So things like you sometimes do this a little bit, 
And then oftentimes the feedback is given in private. Here again, you can see different cultures and where they align. Um, Russia and Germany, for example, are much farther along or closer to the negative, uh, direct negative feedback side. And cultures like Indonesia, India, China, and Mexico are closer to indirect negative feedback. <clears throat> the next indicator is persuading. And this is how we uh, try to persuade people to act. So the first type of culture is principles first. These cultures value the why. They have been trained to develop the theory or the concept before presenting the facts, the statements, or the opinions. On the other hand, applications first cultures value the how or the what first. They're trained to begin with the facts and the statements or opinions, and then they back up the conclusion as necessary. This is oftentimes where you get things like executive summaries or really like what this is about. And then you can read more about how we got to the conclusion. And what Erin Meyer says in her book is that Prince, somebody from France, for example, might get really frustrated if they have somebody from the United States who always tells them to do something and it might explain the what they're trying to achieve. But unless they hear the why first, it's frustrating. And what this means is that there's no right or wrong way to approach something. These are just how different cultures uh, might, uh, are, are just how society is in different cultures. And so in order to work together better, we need to better understand the differences and uh, have empathy for how people do things. I want to give an example of what a culture map actually looks like. This is an example from the 2020 GNOME Foundation Board of Directors, where we have directors from backgrounds from the United Kingdom, United States, Brazil, Mexico, and Nigeria. And on the right-hand side, you can see an image of what a culture map looks like. It looks kind of like a bunch of lines randomly put together, but this is what a culture map looks like. And if you look at the third from the bottom, the trusting indicator, this is about how cultures build trust. And there are some cultures that are task-based and some that are relationship-based. Task-based cultures uh, build trust by working alongside each other. So the more that somebody uh, completes tasks, the more you start to build that trust and, um, and yeah, that's how you build trust. In other cultures, relationship uh, trust building is important. This means that you want to get to know the person outside of work. So going out to lunch might be important and asking about family, friends, hobbies, finding other commonalities, again, outside of work. Uh, what Aaron Meyer says is that trust or task-based trust-building cultures, the, a lot of times relationships are very specific to a particular job, or in this case, a particular open source community, for example, if you're working alongside somebody. And, and, and if somebody moves away from that job or open source uh, community, they, the relationship won't be as uh, strong versus relationship trust building cultures because they uh, have really invested in getting to know each other outside of work, a lot of times those relationships persist beyond um, just that job opportunity or the open source uh, contribution time that they've spent there. And what this means is that here you can see that the board of directors for GNOME, there's somebody from the United States who is very task-based trust building and then we have board of directors from Mexico, Brazil, and Nigeria that are more relationship-based. And this means they might want to find activities where they not only have meetings to get work done, but they might also want to engage in coffee chats or some sort of social activity in order to build that trust in order to then work together better. So by understanding, by mapping things out with groups that you work closely with, you might develop better understanding in order to work better closely together. 
Some final tips for navigating cultural differences are to invest time in getting to know the people that you work with, especially those that you work most closely with, not to make assumptions. For example, someone might speak and in a certain way that makes you think that they're from a certain culture or they might look like they're from a certain culture, but they might not identify as part of that culture. Um, so don't make assumptions. And then I think that it's okay to establish expectations. Um, for example, the uh, at GitLab where I work, they have a cross-culture collaboration guide, which I've linked to at the bottom of this slide, where they talk about different things that uh, GitLab tries to uh, do. So for example, they acknowledge that there are both low context cultures and high context cultures, and they explain what those are. And then they say that GitLab tends towards low context communication. And that helps everybody develop an understanding of what the differences are, and then also try to tend towards one. And that's great. I think that we just need to make sure that we're understanding those trade-offs, for example, how it then uh, affects our hiring process or um, who we're, we're uh, like really, the, the type of community that we're fostering, all of this kind of stuff, in order to make sure that people from high context cultures, for example, still find a place and that, um, you know, there isn't bias against them. So uh, as long as people understand this, I think that, that you can proceed in a way that is culturally sensitive. And with all of this, I think it's really important for empathy to be our guide. We'll talk about this a lot, but when we're collaborating with people, don't assume and just make sure you take the time to try to understand them. All right, we're moving on to this improving feedback section. And the thing that I want to make sure everybody comes away with today is that giving and receiving feedback is a skill set that we can all build. So if you think that you're that you get defensive when receiving feedback or that you that you find giving feedback awkward, just know that it's something that we can continue to develop and get better at. And in order to do that, we first have to be aware of underlying biases and tendencies because we're all affected by our own stereotypes and just our perceptions of of how we see the world. And something that's really interesting is that feedback is a good thing. So even if it's difficult, it is good. And it's actually linked. Feedback seeking behavior is linked to higher job satisfaction, to being more creative on the job and adapting to things more quickly. And specifically seeking negative feedback is associated with higher performance. So this is a good thing. But I want to acknowledge that receiving negative feedback is tough. And this is because we feel bad emotions more strongly than we feel the good ones because our brains are wired to detect threats in order to help us survive. So back in the day, you know, we saw a cheetah, our fight, flight, or fight, or freeze instinct would kick in and we would, and, and that's how we reacted. And similarly, we see, we often see neg negative feedback as a threat and that same instinct of fight, flight or freeze kicks in. So here are some tips for how to get better at receiving negative feedback. The first one is that it's okay to take some time. And in fact, we should try to incorporate this as a regular practice to make time between when we receive the feedback and when we respond to the feedback. And if that seems difficult, don't worry. It's not just difficult for you. Um, and one way to help with that of like making it an, a regular practice to build in time is to create a script to help you do that. So something like, thanks for the feedback. I'm going to take some time to process it and I'll get back to you later. And while this might feel weird to say, it might sound forced or whatever it is, uh, the more and more that you practice this, the better it'll get. 
and it'll just help you make it again a regular practice to take that time that you need. Sometimes, as I mentioned, our body starts to react in a certain way because our, our nervous system gets triggered and we go into that fight, flight, or freeze mode. So if you notice that your physical body is reacting, for example, your heart is beating faster, your head is getting hot, or there's a lot of pressure building, your body is very tense, um, you can try a breathing exercise. And one of the things that, or one of the breathing techniques that I've learned is called the box breathing exercise, or in other words, like four, 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 where you breathe in for four seconds, you hold it for four seconds, and you breathe out for four seconds, and then you repeat that four times, at least four times. And what this does by holding the breath even for four seconds, it just helps you lower your heart rate and be able to start to ground yourself, start to eliminate the physical symptoms that you might get from receiving the negative feedback. And the whole point of this is to really process the feedback. Because if somebody tells you something, even if it's not done very tactfully or it's done in what you think is a rude way, there might be a kernel of truth in the feedback or something that might actually help you progress or improve in some way. So when you're processing the feedback, make sure to ask yourself things like, what is true about what you heard? What do you think is biased? And how can you use the feedback to progress? Another thing that might help you as you're trying to process the feedback and be able to uh, respond appropriately is identifying your triggers. There's this great book uh, called Thank You for the Feedback, The Science and Art of Receiving Feedback Well. And it talks about three different triggers that we might experience. The first one is a truth trigger, which is about the content of the feedback itself. We somehow feel that it's off, unhelpful, or just not true. There was a relationship trigger where it's not about what the person said or the content. It's really more about the relationship that we have with the person. So we might think that they're unqualified to give it to us, or we might feel like they're our friend and they betrayed us. So it ends up focusing on, you end up focusing on the relationship instead of the feedback itself. And then there's identity triggers where the feedback that we just received causes us to question our sense of identity. We, in this case, we end up feeling overwhelmed, threatened, ashamed, and off balance. And somehow we end up just trying to survive. So now that we've talked about how to receive feedback and the different things that we need to sort through as we're processing the feedback, let's talk about ways to give better feedback. And the first thing that we need to do is think about the type of feedback that we're trying to give. In that same book, we talk, it, the author talks about three different types of feedback. There's evaluation feedback, which helps the person understand where they are and the expectations. There's coaching feedback that helps the person improve. And there's positive or appreciation feedback, which motivates and encourages. When you're giving feedback, it's also good to make sure you're giving the feedback to the right person at the right in the right place at the right time. And what this means that, you know, with the right person, it's probably best to approach the person that you have a misunderstanding with instead of speaking to four or five other people and, you know, maybe not getting to the bottom of it. So make sure you have the right person that you're giving the feedback to in the right place in the right time. So for example, if you know that this person is about to sign off, it might be late in their day, you know that they typically tend to log off around this time or that it's in the middle of their work day, it might not be the best time to start a difficult conversation. Instead, you might want to ask them for an hour or so of their time
to hop on a video chat or just to, to hop on to Element or something else where you can chat, but in a more interrupted, uninterrupted way. Another thing, um, I, I participated in this workshop uh, about a year ago that they talked about when you're giving feedback to try to engage both sides of your brain and, and use the structure of when I think it makes me feel. And by this, it's like when you're in a difficult conversation, you might say, when I think that you're ignoring me, it makes me feel unheard, uh, sad, unappreciated. And so by, by combining these two phrases, you end up uh, not accusing somebody because it's I when I think that this is happening, it makes me feel this way. So it, it shifts away from, it, it helps uh, make it so that the other person doesn't have to get defensive. Um, and it lets them know how the action made you feel. So it talks about emotions, and then you would have a, a conversation around that in a way where it sort of de-escalates the feelings around it. So you might wanna give that a try. Another thing, even though we just talked about how different cultures give negative feedback in different ways, uh, generally tend towards giving positive feedback in public and negative feedback in private. Um, this will help uh, just as you're giving feedback uh, to people around different cultures. Okay, this is a section that I just put in um, because I think it's really interesting, this idea about intent versus impact. Because I think that there's a larger gap between intent and impact in FOSS communities because we mostly interact in virtual settings. And for those of you who are new to intent versus impact, I just wanna throw out a definition. And this is that intent is what you mean to say or do, and impact is how your audience perceives what you do or what you say. So it's what you intended to happen versus what actually happened. Now, what influences our perception? In person, we get a lot of cues. You can look at somebody's body language, whether they're smiling when they give you the feedback or they're frowning or you know their tone of voice is a certain way, their uh, volume is really upset or you know like high or you can you can get these cues to let you know how somebody might be feeling. Online, we don't usually have that. So instead, things that influence our perception might be what we think we know about the person. For example, oh, we know that person is based in Germany. Or, oh, this person uses a lot of emojis or doesn't punctuate or different things like this. Those are the things that influence our perception. And I think that the gap between intent and impact, again, is larger. Because, and, and here's an example. If you're filing a bug report and you say something like, this bug is so irritating, it makes me want to jump out of a window. And meanwhile, you know, you're sipping on some tea in front of your computer, you're just kind of multitasking and you just, that's what you write. And your intent with writing this was, you know, filing a bug report that you think is mildly annoying, um, you added the, the jumping out of the window part because that's your sense of humor. You think it's kind of funny and you're actually in a good mood, mood because you're sipping on some tea. But because it's written and people can't tell this about you, the impact might actually be very different or the person who reads it might think you're really angry and that might make them really angry or make them sad. So, what I want people to take away from this is that intent and impact are equally important. It doesn't just matter what you wanted to uh, convey or what you intended. The impact of what you actually did and said is just as important. And just the same, when you are impacted, it's important to try to understand 
what the person's intent really was in order to reduce that gap. When we're talking about reducing the gap, the SBI model is something that can be really useful. And for those of you not familiar with the SBI model, here's what it means. The S stands for situation. So you describe the situation and you're specific about where it occurred. The B is about behavior. So you describe observable behavior and you don't assume what you think the other person was thinking. I is for impact, and that is describing your emotions, your feelings, your reaction from the observable behavior. And then finally, this is what you're really getting at is the intent. So you want to ask what the person's original intent is after you go after that SBI. And to make this a little bit more tangible for people, here's what an example would look like. So when you're having a difficult conversation, you know, you, you think that somebody did some, like, sent you an email that was really hurt, hurtful, you might want to approach them and describe it in this way, where you say, for example, hey, when you responded to the email I sent about engagement ideas last Friday, that's describing the situation and you're very specific about it was last Friday and via email, then you describe the behavior you said that I shouldn't have, a, that I didn't have a background in design, so my opinion shouldn't count. And then that's, you know, not having judgment. You're not saying like that was really rude or whatever it is. <laughs> and then you describe the impact. So that made me feel excluded from the conversation, even though it's a community wide topic, and I felt hurt by the public comment. And that really like lets them know what the impact was. Then you want to follow that up with a question of something like, what were you hoping to accomplish with that? Or can you help me understand what went, like what was happening there? Um, and this again helps us understand what their intent was. It also lets them know what the impact was, again, in order to reduce that gap between intent and impact. Okay. We're now on to the section about requesting feedback. It's just one slide, so stay with me. Um, because when we first started this section, we talked about how requesting feedback is linked with higher performance and um, more creativity and all these good things. So when you're requesting feedback, you want to make sure that you make it specific. Asking somebody a broad question like, can you give me feedback on my presentation? isn't going to give you the level of detail or maybe what you're hoping for as a more specific request like can you give me feedback on how quickly i speak and how much eye contact i make during my presentation then you give people like tangible things that they should be looking for and they'll be able to better give you that feedback Another thing is to solicit feedback from multiple sources. So ask for five different people because they might have different perspectives or might simply catch something that someone else missed. All right, so let's talk now about active listening because we can't always just talk, we also need to listen. And I love this quote by Richard Carlson, which says that being heard and understood is one of the greatest desires of the human heart. And I don't know about you, but I've been in situations before where the speaker is talking and there's somebody else listening and the speaker says, you know, you're just not listening to me. And the person listening is able to repeat exactly what they've been saying for the last five minutes. And the person speaking is like, okay, you heard me, but, but you're still not listening. And it's frustrating for both the listener and the speaker because there's some kind of miscommunication there. The, the person, the speaker doesn't feel heard and the listener is frustrated because they're actually listening. So in order to help with this situation, let's talk about different types of listening that we can engage in. The first is distracted listening. And this is when you're multitasking or preoccupied. You're simply distracted. There's content listening, where you're listening to the facts and, and planning on how to respond. 
So for example, if somebody's talking and you're like, oh, I have to respond to this. And then you start thinking about your answer. And meanwhile, you've stopped listening to them because you're thinking about how to respond. There's also identifying listening where you're trying to respond with a similar situation to show that you understand. So let's say that your friend is going to Hawaii next month and they're so excited about this Hawaii trip and they just wanna tell you all about their plans and you listen and then you're like, I went to Hawaii last, or last year. Let me tell you about that. I did this and that and this and that. And now instead of listening, you're talking. <laughs> so you're no longer listening. And then there's problem solving, which especially when we care about the person, we're invested in that relationship, we just want to help them solve the problem. And what we have to understand is that someone may not be ready to start solving that problem. So what I want you to take away from this is that active listening is the best type of listening that we can do. And this is where we hear the facts and the feelings and we respond appropriately to both. And what this means is that, for example, if you have somebody that comes in, they're visibly upset, they might be pacing and holding their head and just unable to really articulate themselves. Instead of automatically starting to problem solve, you might realize that really what they need is a hug, maybe some ice cream, and then maybe in an hour or two, then they'll be ready to problem solve. Or maybe you should be asking them some questions before and just listening, letting them, you know, vent for a while and then go into problem solving. So active listening is all about listening to both the facts and the feelings, recognizing they're both just as important and then trying to respond appropriately to both. Great, active listening sounds like gold, but how do we do this? So the first is that we can use simple signals and simple questions to help with active listening. Much like a traffic light is green, yellow, and red to show us if we should go, yield, or stop, our actions and what we say helps people know whether they should continue to talk, stop, or slow down. So for example, with our actions, looking at people in the eye, putting down our phone, um, and, and really being there with, you know, our, our pointing our body in their direction, et cetera, helps them understand what, that we're there. It signals them to go. And verbal cues are just as important. It can't just all be body language. So with verbal cues, you can say, you can ask simple questions or just um, little, words that help show that you're along that same story. So things like, really? Or, oh, wow. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Things like this are like, you know, what, do you, what did you do next? How did they respond? All of those things help somebody know that we're there, that we're engaged, that we're, that we're with them, that they should continue to go. Another thing that helps us engage in active listening is paraphrasing. And this is something that I'm still trying to get better at because it's very powerful. And what this is, is not repeating word for word what somebody said. It's instead identifying keywords and the meaning of what has been said and making sure that you fully understood what the message was. And paraphr paraphrasing is really important because Sometimes the speaker might not have said what they really meant, or maybe you didn't understand what they actually wanted to say. So when you paraphrase and you get it right, it helps the speaker feel truly understood and heard. It also, the cool thing about it is that you don't have to agree with them. You could say something like, uh, okay, so I hear you. Um, what I hear you say is that you think that next year's open source 101 should be in a volcano. Is that right? And then the person's like, yes, that's exactly what I meant. And you might think that, you know, having the conference in a volcano might not be the best idea, but you've showed that you at least understand what the other person is saying. 
and that you know you can then have that discussion it can buy you time it buys space for more ideas all this stuff and sometimes when you just paraphrase and you and you show that you really understood it can provide a summary that can lead to closure you see the person's shoulders visibly relax like they they feel that you have understood them so it's a pretty cool tool and Active listening is something that is important for building relationships, whether you're in the virtual world or in person. Uh, you can definitely use these principles online, but more importantly, when we're back in in-person events, you can use these to build relationships that will then carry on into the online world. All right, we have just a few minutes left, so I'll share my favorite hacks. The first is that it's the writer's job to be understood and formatting really helps. So by this, I mean that we should avoid long sentences. If you see many ands, you can try to instead bring it up into two sentences. Don't assume previous knowledge. So try to make it so that anybody can jump right into the conversation or into the issue, into the bug report, et cetera. Do a skim test, look through what you've just written and make sure that somebody can quickly look at it in just a few seconds and understand the main points. So for example, here, I've uh, put a summary of each sentence at the beginning of each bullet and have made it purple so that it's easy to really read even the first little bit and understand what the rest is about. And this helps because even if you use bullets, it can look like a wall of text and then also it helps people be able to refer back to it because they can skim back what they've already read and quickly and easily like read more thoroughly or whatever they need. And then make sure that what you've written has a call to action. So make sure that some people know who needs to do it by when um, and that it's just clear. And we can all do this in the issues and the bug reports and everything else that we're writing. So for example, this is a GitLab issue from our social team where they've created a template called social general request where they've used headings to help you understand the different sections of what you need to fill out. They've used emoticons to help make it a little more visibly uh, appealing. They've used things like bold and numbering and check boxes and things like that so that it's easier to act and to do things that they need you to perform. All right, this next principle is called yes and. And this is simply that instead of saying no or yes but, you say yes and. And I, I don't know if you've heard this before, but oftentimes you say that anything before the but doesn't really matter. You say, yeah, 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 but this is what I mean. Like none of the rest really matters. It's really just after the but. This kind of, this, this helps with that because what you're doing is you are acknowledging what the person is saying and then you can still disagree with them. So yes, I understand that this is what you, what you think, and I think that we should also consider this. And so what it does by acknowledging the other person's thoughts and, and really what they were saying, it makes them more likely to listen to you and to acknowledge your point of view. Because if they feel ignored or like you're not really taking into account what they're saying, they're more less likely to, um, to listen to you. So try using yes and, it's a whole like state of mind even, um, and it really helps to build collaboration. Last but not least, collaborative phrases. By using these simple little word changes, you can unlock uh, collaboration. So for example, saying, instead of saying something like, we need to get more social media uh, engagement, you might say, how might we get more social media engagement? And this shifts it so that others feel like they can participate. They might end up taking more ownership because they've had a chance to actually brainstorm and be considered. Uh, other collaborative phrases include things like, might I suggest we, what are your thoughts? Um, and, and then different ways of just voicing your idea. In 
the end, I know we're, we're pretty much at time, um, but I want to end with this really strong, powerful quote by John Powell, which is that communication works for those who work at it. Communication is a technical skill that we all need to keep building that helps us not only in open source, but in all areas of our life. And again, it's something that we can build. So I hope you have taken some, uh, some learnings from my, uh, from my speech today that you can start applying right away. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer a few of them in the minutes that we have left. And if not, feel free to tweet me or send me a message on LinkedIn. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will look at the questions. Okay, so here I see a few. Um, somebody, Mark Hutchinson, Hutchinson says, or asks, what are the best ways to deal with trolls and bots? And, you know, that's a good question. I've talked a lot about communication and how to engage in difficult conversations. I think that with trolls, I mean, kind of the definition of a troll is that they're trying to poke and make, uh, cause difficult situations. And in those cases, oftentimes you just need to disengage and to lean in on your code of conduct to help, um, to help with those situations. It might be ejecting that community member if they persist in violating the code of conduct. So, um, all right, the next question is also from Mark. I run a meetup group trying to get the members to suggest topics and speakers is akin to pulling teeth. Got any suggestions on growing member involvement in user groups? Um, I think that's more about engagement in general, so not necessarily about the topic that I'm covering in this communication hacks. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, with topics and speakers, so something that um, we're doing at GitLab, for example, um, one of the things that you know we all hear is that it's some oftentimes difficult for women to volunteer to speak um, for many different reasons or to get women speakers. And um, one of the things that we're doing is a Beyond Code series where people will be able to talk about how they use GitLab in their day-to-day -day jobs um, outside of coding, because GitLab uses its own platform for everything from accounting to sales to uh, marketing to you know coding and engineering practice or you know work. So by expanding the topics and then um, also like messaging people in in uh, in chats that are specific to. Uh, like we have, for example, a women TMRG group, which is like a women's team resource group, um, adding stuff there um, and like also messaging people one-to-one uh, -one and inviting them. Um, that has been really powerful. So takeaways, make sure that you're, uh, you know, seeking to broaden your pipeline and really, um, you know, identifying other communities where you can um, try to recruit from that might align with your own community. Um, and two, encouraging people personally, um, that is a really powerful way to get more engagement. All right, uh, we have one minute left. Who determines what the values of an open source project is? Um, again, this is not necessarily the, um, uh, part of my, oh, okay. I might even be reading questions that are not to my, for my, um, for my talk, but <laughs> I'll chime in on this. I think that, um, the community together needs to, um, come up with the shared values and off. And I think that the board of directors or the governing group has a big role to play in, in facilitating that. Um, all right, I hope I answered questions from everybody for my session and also other people's sessions. 
Uh, and if you have any other questions, feel free to message me on Twitter or LinkedIn. It's been a pleasure.